Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. I am Ross Morasso, and my guest today, Michelle Dickey, trauma specialist, consultant, coach, and founder at Consulting for Heightened Awareness. She's out of Rockwell, North Carolina, but she's available to you all over the world. We've had some fascinating conversations before. Michelle, welcome back. Hi, Ross. Great to be back. And so, you're right about the fascinating conversation indeed. <laughs> so uh, you were hinting at me that you had a bit of an announcement here before we, uh, as we got started here. So what's up with that? Yeah, on, on a previous, you know, as we're learning new things, you know, about all the tech stuff, when I launched the course and I made the announcement, the course, How the Trauma Bond is Formed, and that's at CHA Academy, BT, btbw.com. And I was, I didn't know that because it's integrated with the website itself, that there's two ways that people can enroll in that course. They can do it through the direct link I just gave or on the website site, which is the cdhrwdrmd.org, the course is listed there as well. And so you, they can also, they can purchase it through either way and they can choose, you know, the one-time payment or if they can do it on the website, they can use shop pay and make four easy installments. If they do it through the direct link. They can do the one-time payment or make five monthly installments. So whatever works for them. So I wanted to go ahead and say, I stand corrected that you can get it two different ways. <laughs> well, for those of us who are tuning in and are hearing you for the very first time, so explain to everybody what this course is for, what it does. The course, it, it breaks it down, okay, in its simplicity on how the trauma bond to an abuser is formed mm. because there, there's a lot of talk about how that trauma bond, which is the addiction to the abuser, and so there's a lot of people who talk about how it is just like a drug addiction, but exactly what does that mean? And so that's where CHA Academy comes in. And that's why I break it down for everyone with just the basic scientific facts. And of course, with God's wisdom. And then I break it down on what's going on inside the brain and the body during that trauma bonding process. Because the more knowledge that we have about what was going on, like between the dopamine and the norepinephrine, which... You know, that back and forth, that constant push-pull, you know, through the abuse. So once we have a better understanding of how that happened, we're better able to detect it going forward when someone's trying to do that. And so we won't get trauma bonded to another abuser again. So uh, e explain this to me, though. How, how would one of us, what's the process of the development of a trauma bond? Like, how do we know? Let's say we have a lot of awareness, which is the name of your company, Heightened Awareness. You know, how do we know that a trauma bond is starting to be formed? What are some of the warning signs? Some of the warning signs would be overly excessive praise and, and, and uh, excessive flattery. You know, because there's a difference between a genuine compliment, right? Yes. But a narcissistic abuser will be over the top. After all, one thing we know about narcissistic abusers as well is that they like to, they'll, they'll overdo things. You know, in other words, let's say you tell them you only need a couple of, you know, blouses, okay, or something like that, whatever. Insert your clothing item here. Mm -hmm. You only need a couple, right? That's it. Well, they'll come back with like 10, right? That's just a simple example of how they overdo. And so they do the same thing with the, excessive flattery and there's subtle ways they'll do it too okay and i'll share with you all because you'll you'll like this there were uh, several of them in one of the toxic workplaces that i told my favorite color was purple too and next thing i know like about every so often they would all get together and wear purple shirts <laughs> okay and I, Mm hmm. I caught on to that. I was like, I see what they're trying. I left him there. I left him in the love bombing stage. You know, I was like, I, yeah, cause that's the other part. Once we learn how that trauma bond is formed and when it's happening, we learn how we keep them there until we can get out of there. You know what I'm saying? So, cause if you keep them there, they, they can't go any further cause it would be the love bomb. And then deep now they did do some devaluing, but again, we, you know, caught on to that. But 
they'll do that love bombing, okay? Because that's what starts the trauma bonding process is through that excess flattery, okay? And, you know, that's putting, basically it's putting their target up on a pedestal, you know, to make their target feel, um, you know, like way special, get a, 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 have a euphoric type of high, okay? I mean, there's nothing wrong with being nice and, you know, doing nice things for people, but there's limitations, you know? But a, a narcissistic user will go overboard, okay? And that's how it starts. And then over a period of time, they'll back that up with what's called a devalue, you know, which is, you know, condescending statements, you know, any kind of put downs, you know, negative statements and verbal abuse, the gaslights and all of that. Those are devaluing tactics, right? So that constant push sport. And then they'll resort back to web bombing, then to devalue. So that's like, you know, a constant push pull. And so over time, it alters the brain chemistry. And so it keeps the target walking on eggshell. And then uncertain, you know, okay, which version are we going to get? The love bomber or the devaluer, you know, like back and forth. And once once they know that the trauma bond is in place, then you won't get as much excessive flattery anymore. It'll mostly be devaluing and verbal abuse and all of that that leads up to what is known as the discard, okay, meaning that Either the narcissistic abuser is going to break up with their target or more often than not, their target ends up being the one that has to leave and does the final discard. So that goes both ways. But then the target has to overcome that trauma bond because they're still once they leave, they're still trauma bonded, you know, obviously, because they're they're going to miss the uh, version that they met of that person. And not, you know, until they realize that 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 person doesn't exist for real, you know, and that the narcissistic abuser was simply mirroring them. And so once that sinks in, that starts to break the trauma bond a little bit once we realize that and we accept it. And we're like, OK, but that's really the simplicity of how it begins. You know, it's just an over time constant up and down, up and down on the emotions like that. And it keeps the it keeps the target stressed out too. You know, that's a big one right there. And so I mean, after all, you if you're you you've given all your all, your heart, your everything to this abuser and you've just given them everything they, you know, they asked for. And that's the other thing. Nothing is ever good enough for them. Mm. That's the, yeah. We learned this. And they also try to make their targets feel like anything their target does, it's just never good enough. That classic right there. And so many of us ended up, we just stopped trying because we got tired of being told that we weren't worth anything because we couldn't do anything right. Oh yeah, many of us have heard that. You know, could let's say whatever it was that they asked us to do and we did it and there was nothing wrong with it but it wasn't done the way they would have done it. So they want to criticize it and all of that, put it down and, and all of that and make their target feel like what they did isn't good enough. So that's another thing that, that they'll do. And that's also a devaluing right there as well, trying to make their target feel small, you know, and many of us were like, you know what, they, they would ask us to do something and we'd be like, mm -mm, no, you got to do it yourself. Because we weren't going to hear no more of that. <laughs> you know what's so. interesting about what you're talking about? And I can almost see like how we as a society, uh, to a degree, enable abusers, right? Because if they're really nice and then you end up with a fight, oh, but then you have, then you make up and you go back and forth, right? We always say, oh, everybody fights and blah, blah, blah. And I could see how even for those of us who are potentially the uh, being targeted, even as we try to go and find um, reassurances or wisdom throughout this, it seems like society isn't set up enough for us to even be able to assist people who might be getting abused because we've normalized so much of what an abuser does. Have you noticed something like that? Oh, all the time, all the time. I mean, that's one thing we, as we're getting that heightened awareness, we learn, we observe more and we speak less. 
Uh, yeah, we see it all the time. And there are a lot of the, they're unaware that they are even engaging in uh, a lot of the narcissistic behaviors and the abuse. They don't, a lot of them don't know that's what it is. And so to them, that's all they know. And we also learn that it's very generational because mm. it gets, yeah, it gets passed down. So for example, many of us have identified that, oh, okay, so great grandparents passed it down to grandparent, grandparents passed it down to parent. And then once it gets to us, it, we, it stops. You know, those of us who become aware and awaken to it and we're like, okay, we don't tolerate that. Basically, we don't tolerate it anymore. That's how it stops with us. And then we start getting our voice back and we do what we're doing to help educate and, you know, help other survivors and, and people get the knowledge that they need that what's going on out here, what's really happening on the ground, you know, with, with all of this. And for many of us, uh, we write books to share our stories and things like that to help others and because they can relate. And then, you know, for, you know, to identify the red flag. The thing is, uh, I had a fellow warrior who's spot on with this, that what we now know are red flags. We used to think were just like odd behaviors, right? Just like a lot mm -hmm. of society. They just think that the behaviors are odd. Oh, it's no big deal. You know, that's just, that's just, that's just who they are. And I'm like, okay, yeah, but that was a, that was a mumble with an incoherent statement. What was that? You know, <laughs> it's sort of like, okay, but now we know what that is. But that is actually like a mini narcissistic collapse. Whenever we hear a narcissist abuser do that, where they start mumbling and it's incoherent, it's like nothing. And it's word salad. It doesn't make any logical sense. Is whatsoever. that because you broke down their game a little bit and they're trying to like it's a physical manifestation of them trying to recreate their mm -hmm. abusive structure again so they could continue on. But you had momentarily interrupted it. And that's why they seem out of sorts. That's it. Yep. You nailed it right there. Let me ask you then, you know, because it is true, people have disagreements and there are couples who bicker and from time to time they do mm -hmm. fight. And so, and, and, and I'm pointing this out, right? As I said, you know, our society seems to be set up for this, but I'm willing to bet that there are obvious, noticeable differences if you have the education like you do, or if people are taking your courses between a genuine disagreement that is also wrapped up inside of maybe a couple of bad days, right? To make it sound that this more heated versus a, you know, quarrels and arguments and fights that are part of the abuser's game. What would you say would be some of the telltale differences between a legitimate dispute that happens because we're all human beings or, you know, we're continuing to be part of this target? Okay, one great way, uh, you know, between two people who agree to disagree, okay? Mm -hmm. And so one, you know, it's like, let's use creamy peanut butter versus uh, crunchy peanut butter, for right. example, okay? <laughs> well, I come up with off the top of my head. All right, let's say one person likes the creamy peanut butter and the other person likes the crunchy peanut butter. And so they automatically aren't going to agree on which one they want to get. So they agree to disagree and we'll get both. You know, that's, that's how they, you know, do. logical, normal people would do that, right? Narcissistic abusers, on the other hand, they would nag and nag. Why don't you, well, why don't you like this? Why don't, let's say you, you're the one that likes the crunchy and the abuser wants to know how come you don't like the creamy? What's wrong with the creamy? Uh, how come you don't like the creamy? I mean, that's how the narcissistic abuser will egg it on, you know, and just keep on, keep on nagging and nagging and nagging. So there's a very big difference right there between a normal, regular, hey, you know, this is what it is. We agree to disagree. Whereas the narcissistic abuser, could, we do learn that a lot of them love to do that. It's like that nitpicking that they like to do, try to get under our skin and get us to step out of character. And that's a lot of the reasons why they do it. And they also will deliberately start an argument out of nowhere. Okay, Whereas 
a a normal you know healthy relationship that had to go through the growing pain okay mm -hmm. that's normal yes whereas they agree to disagree they reach a compromise they can reach uh some sort of uh, middle ground okay but a narcissistic abuser <laughs> you're not going to be able to find a middle ground with them right so so as an example let's say the abuser is actually maybe someone who does some of the grocery shopping right so they would go and if their target likes crunchy when they go to the grocery store even though they're very clear now that their target or partner likes crunchy they would come home with only the creamy kind right and then probably almost be daring their target to speak up about that Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's very common, too, that if we we learned that, that if we sent the narcissistic abuser to the store and we said, yeah, we need, let's say, uh, flour, they would deliberately come back with sugar. Oh, yeah, mm. that's actually happened to fellow warrior. And I was like, well, I'm not surprised. And that done deliberately, yes, to to kind of like see if they can get their uh their target to speak up so that they could have that argument that, you know, caused that friction. So yeah. then would the abuser say, Oh, I forgot. Or would they then maybe say, no, you told me to get sugar. Like would they sort of almost, yeah, how does that work? Okay. There's several different ways. Yes. Okay. They would stay, they w might say that they forgot or they will say, uh, well, I thought flour would be better. Okay. You know, they'll say stuff like mm -hmm. that. Um, so that's, yeah, a couple of different ways. But yeah, yeah, they'll or make up some other excuse. <laughs> that's what they do. You know, I've heard people uh, say in the past, um, and I've heard this with people who are referring to people that have a, that are borderline, borderline personality disorder. Now, I'm not going to say that every single person with borderline is an abuser, but in this particular case, it seemed to fit the mold. And they had commented, and so we can, uh, this comment makes sense that basically, you know, when you're dealing with a borderline or in your case, you know, you're dealing with an abuser when you feel like you're the one who's crazy after you're done talking through their own nonsense. Have you run into something like that before? Oh, that's the common, common thing for you know all survivors when they first come out of the narcissistic abuse situation is because it's that, you know, we refer to that that rug being pulled out from under us, okay? Because that's exactly what happens. It's like when their true colors just finally pop out all the way and we're just, boom, you know, I mean, mind blown by like what is in front of us. Who is this person? Is it, yeah, not who, we, not who we thought we met, you know? And so it does, it takes a while to, to, to sort through that. And so we do have a uh, part of the healing process there is like a season okay that we're going to feel like we're the ones going crazy because we thought that that person was you know someone else and then we start and because we also start to notice because the same patterns we start to notice them in, in others that we've that we've been known for years but didn't see it before and so yeah it's going to make us feel like we're the one going a little bit crazy until we realize that wait a second you know the abuse that's what's crazy you know not not us it's just they call us crazy because we caught on to it and so that rug being pulled out from under us like i refer to that as just you know god's turning everything back in the upright position where it was supposed to be to start with because during the trauma bonding process, what happened was it's like our world slowly but surely was getting turned upside down to fit into the narcissistic abuser's upside down world. And so we would kind of, we kind of, I guess you could say, conformed to it a little bit because, you know, we were, we loved them, you know, we wanted to be with them. They promised us everything they promised us the future they promised this you know this a life together they promised uh that that the house with the picket fence you know kind of all of that so mm. uh, yeah their future so, fakes as you would call that right yeah exactly yep there you go and so it slowly turned everything up our world upside down so now during the healing process it's got to get put back in the upright position 
And so it is going to be a little bit shaky here and there uh, because we start to notice these things and that and the same patterns of narcissism and the abuse, you know, out there. And like in grocery stores, we start to notice it in people because you could once you get well versed in it, you, know, you kind of tell when the adults are throwing a temper tantrum and we see it. So we don't miss it anymore. You know, whereas before we would turn a blind eye to it because we didn't know how to handle it either. And so there's a lot of people out there who still don't know, you know, they're like, and, and understandably so because we were there once before too, that whenever a grown adult would act that way, it kind of made everybody just like stand still, like, what do, what do we do? You know, I have no idea what to do with that. And that's very, very common. You know, I, I, in the, in the earlier parts of our show, you know, we've been referring to this as a theme as we've been talking about how we as society can normalize, you know, what would be abusive behavior, because sometimes it was just a poor moment for a human being, right, who can authentically feel bad about what they've done and, and then, you know, repair their relationship versus uh, and because we're flawed human beings. Right. And so you take all the billions of us out there and the interactions we have. There's always these examples of what could be a, quote unquote, normal um, you know, situation of a freak out. But I start to wonder as I talk with you, Michelle, that like we had a boss at an old job I had who would throw chairs across the room, not yelling at any in particular employee or anything like that, but just it was one of those spaces where it was um, like a big bullpen. You know, people said their cubicles, low walls, you could dozens of people around. And then the boss would get upset and chuck a chair. And I wonder now, like looking at that, thinking that's just directly, that's not a bad day. That's abusive behavior. I'm curious to know where, how we can sort of draw our own lines to uh, stop ourselves from accepting unacceptable behavior. Does society need, in your opinion, you know, we can sages of your can you know, debate this to the ends of the earth but from what you see and the clients that you work with and the education you have do you think we as a society need to be taking a harder critical look at how we are all behaving and what is acceptable behavior and not yeah that would be a great start you know because it, it it's us learning how to hold ourselves accountable like we talked about before uh, because the narcissistic abusers, they don't like to do that. They don't think they do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely correct about that, the um, throwing of the chair because they got mad or something didn't go their way. Uh, because nar narcissistic abusers are easily irritated. Very, mm -hmm. very easily. Yeah, easily irritated, just like a toddler. So something doesn't go quite their way. Or somebody asks them a question and they don't know the answer they'll get frustrated with that too they'll get and, and I've, I've i see it a lot in narcissistic abusers who they just get agitated especially if a comfort zone routine gets a little out of whack they get really irritated and really mad so yes as a society we could and and i think there's a lot of us out here who are embarking on that as far as you know teaching how to do the inner work and get that regulation because that really is the trauma healing right there where it begins is with being able to recognize within ourselves okay hold up a second you know what you know not that we know the abuse is not our fault no 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 but we did pick up some I guess you could say bad habits until we knew better it's all part of growing and maturing, right? So, but the narcissistic abusers, they don't want to do that. So they're the difference. And so it helps us be able to identify them better when we take it upon ourselves and do that inner work within ourselves so that we do grow and mature like we're supposed to. And then we're able to spot them a lot quicker. Do you think name calling in fights is a clearer or more red flag in nature to be the difference between a legitimate dispute and 
uh, an abuser trying to be abusive? Oh, absolutely. Because even if you're having a disagreement with someone, there's no need for name calling. Absolutely. No, uh -uh, that is a red flag because, you know, let's face it, <laughs> you know, if we're not going to if we're not going to respect the person by calling them by their actual name, you know, or, you know, Mr. or Mrs. and last name or what have you, and, you know, simple respect, then, you know what? You know how the old saying goes, it says, uh, if you don't have anything nice to say, then just don't say anything at all. Sure. Right? And that's really the bottom line. If, you know, if, cause name calling, that's, that's, uh, that's child's play, you know? That, that, that is, that's so childish and very unnecessary. That definitely can help you tell the difference between whether you're in a fight with a narcissistic abuser who's dishing out name calling, especially, you know, the, uh, the curse word one and stuff like that. The, yeah. 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 They, oh man, they love to do that. It also seems like there'd be a difference between cursing out of a general sense of frustration or cursing at another human being. Right. So that's not necessarily name calling, but it's, I think it's sort of in the same family there. Right. 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 Yeah. There is a difference because if the narcissistic abuser, they'll use it for name calling and stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. But when someone does, yeah, you know, every we're human, but many of us work on that as well. We try not to do that. Uh, but out of simple uh, frustration, there is a big difference. Like, let's say, you know, we, we, you know, forgot, we forgot something at the store. We're like, oh, you know, and we go back and get it. But a narcissist, oh, a narcissistic abuser, if, if they do, I, I want, oh my goodness. I remember asking one when he did that, he dropped a fork on the floor and got so mad at himself. His face got red and he got so mad. And I remember asking him, I was like, why are you so mad? Have you always been like that? You know, I was like, it's no big deal. You know, mm. you, you know, yeah. I mean, he was really making a big deal out of it. And then I realized something. I said, ah. Oh, I'll bet as he was growing up, he got yelled at for dropping stuff. So that would do it. Right. Right. Because it's a learned behavior somewhere. You said earlier on, that's a generational thing. Mm hmm. Yep. Yeah. And so that's what I was able to not feeling sorry for him or anything, but knowing where that was coming from, because I was like that. I mean, it, it, you just talked before. It's no big deal. It didn't break nothing. It didn't hurt nobody, you know, but got like so mad at himself like you could see him get like all 10 red in the face and i was like very odd you know i love these conversations michelle we're almost out of time and i think today was a good theme of looking upon abusers as little babies you know i think it's a great way to take them off any sort of pedestal it's a great way of uh making it easy to not validate their actions in any way, shape or form, right? Because, you know, some five-year-old, the way they behave, we put them say they're five, you know? And so it's a way to keep distance and some objectivity. If we happen to be a target or if we happen to be witnessing the abuser putting their attentions on somebody else. So before we go, though, uh, one more time, Michelle Dickey, tell us all where we can find you and then we'll have to say goodbye for now. But you are always welcome back on the show. I certainly always love our conversations. Likewise, Ross. Thank you. Yes, everybody can always reach me at 704-245-4340 or send me an email at michelle.dickey at cdhrwdrmd.org. And you can always find the contact information right on the homepage of the website. Down there at the bottom, you'll see contact info. So it's always there. And then on the YouTube channel, it's out there. <laughs> so anybody can reach out to me with any questions. As always, we highly encourage people to do that. Sending love and light to all fellow warriors. Thank you for watching, listening, and for, for your support. Till next time, let's show some gratitude to the Heavenly Father and you. Keep being you in Jesus' name. Amen. And I'm Ross Morasso, and thank you all for listening. Until next time. 
Are you looking for even more of the podcasts and hosts that you love? The Podcast Business News Network is proud to announce that you now have even more ways to listen live. Check out the MyTuner Radio, Online Radio Box, and Simple Radio apps on iOS and Android, or find us online. Search for Business News Network on MyTuner-Radio.com, or search Podcast Business News Network on Streama.com and OnlineRadioBox.com slash US. Take your podcast on the go and don't miss a minute of the action. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. For nearly 2,000 severely injured veterans, everyday life has become filled with barriers. Day-to-day simple tasks can become pretty daunting. I have to carry my chair up two flights of steps or have somebody do it for me. What scares me the most is just the falling. When I'm struggling with my house, I think, you know, to have that one great barrier just knocked down, I mean, it's... It's crucial. Home for Our Troops is a wonderful nonprofit that builds a mortgage free, fully adaptive, handicap accessible house. And there's no catch. It'll be our very first home that we've ever owned. This is a game changer. This is where your life begins again. We need you to join us in completing this important mission. Please visit HFOTUSA.org and help build homes and rebuild lives. Because of you, everything's. It's going to be okay. 